What's up, friends? Jason Minnis here. Welcome to the Challenging Conversation show brought to you by the Edify Podcast Network. This podcast aims to empower Christians to have challenging conversations with people of a different mindset, but to do so with grace and truth. It seems like every time you jump online or scroll through your social media feeds, you read about another church scandal. Just reading about another supposed man of God falling from grace and ruining the lives of countless people makes your blood boil. But why? Why are there so many spiritual leaders living such hypocritical and sinful lives? Just in the past few years, the world has witnessed the rise and fall of Mark Driscoll from Mars Hill Church, Ravi Zacharias, who is arguably one of the most recognizable Christian uh, apologists in the world. And then you have Jerry Falwell Jr., the former president of Liberty University and all the scandal that went with his life. And the disgraced lead pastor of Hillsong Church in New York and the former spiritual advisor to Justin Bieber, Carl Lentz. And now the founder of Hillsong, Brian Houston. The sad and honest truth is there are millions of Christians who have been devastated by a church scandal. And many young people have become disillusioned about Christianity because of the immoral behavior of Christian leaders. As a pastor, I want every one of you, of my faithful listeners and those who watch Challenging Conversations on a regular basis to know that I am bringing this up not to bash or to criticize or even spread gossip about certain evangelical leaders. My purpose is to talk about these controversial issues, these topics of scandalism in the church on this show because I want to help you guys discuss these issues in light of scripture and hopefully bring some needed guidance and some healing to those who have been devastated by a church scandal. So on the show today, I've invited a good friend and colleague, Warren Cole Smith, who is the president of Ministry Watch. Warren is also a reputable journalist and a writer who knows a thing or two about church scandals. I've always appreciated Warren's passion for Christ and his pursuit of the truth and the delicacy and the resilience he brings to sensitive topics like the one that we're going to be discussing today. Warren, my friend, welcome to the Challenging Conversations show. Well, Jason, it's so great to be on with you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Look forward to this conversation. Yeah, you know, before you and I came on, I just, I told you briefly, and I hope I didn't, you know, startle you, but this is a conversation, quite honestly, that I don't like talking about as a pastor. I've been a pastor for almost 25 years, and I've had my fair share, not personally, thank God, but I've had a lot of people who I served alongside and come to find out they were sleeping around, uh, you know, doing drugs or dipping into the church budget uh, or, you know, having an affair with someone on church staff. And it's quite honestly, Warren, it, it, it's shaken me and it's, it's been disturbing. And I know all the years you've been doing ministry, you have seen your fair share of church scandals, haven't you? Well, I certainly have. And, you know, I, uh, I agree with you, Jason, it gives me no pleasure. I do not take any you know, glee in reporting these stories. But, you know, as you and I are having this conversation, we're coming out of the Easter season. Actually, we're entering the Easter season. Technically Mm -hmm. speaking, we're still in the Easter season, coming out of a season, though, that uh, of, of repentance and reflection, the season of Lent. And it always struck me that we would call the day that Jesus was crucified, you know, arguably, you could make a case that that was like the worst day in history, the day that Jesus was crucified. And yet, what day, do, what do we call that? We call that Good Friday. So I, I think that there is a real sense in which, uh, as Christians, yes, these stories are hard, they're tough, they can be depressing if we don't look at them with the right perspective. But on the other side, they can be the first step towards restoration. They can be the first step towards healing. They can be the first step towards looking clearly at the brokenness of the world and even the brokenness in our own lives and then taking steps uh, to move beyond that. And hopefully that's what we'll accomplish on the show. And that's why I asked for my listeners to know, for Warren to be with us for two episodes, because this is a very sensitive topic. And it's one that we are all faced with, whether it be some of the people I mentioned in the beginning with Carl Lentz or Brian Houston, uh, you know, uh, and there's other ones I'm sure that Warren and I will be discussing in a minute. 
But we want you guys to understand that we come with this, having our own personal experiences and reflecting in scripture and even conversations I've had with you, Warren, through the years and many other colleague friends of ours, because we want to also address this on a, in a private sense. Sometimes we've had to confront some of these people uh, privately, respectfully, but there comes a time when you have to do it publicly. So one of the things I wanted you to dive right in to explain, Warren, is what you actually do now, because just to set people up, you for many years have obviously been with World Mag for many years as a journalist. You've written thousands of articles, done a lot of journalist investigation uh, in your ministry, but you were also with the Colson Center for many years, but then you recently in the last few years went back to Ministry Watch. So tell people what the mission of Ministry Watch is. Yeah, the, the, the goal of Ministry Watch is to bring transparency and accountability to the Christian ministry marketplace. And I got to say, Jason, you will probably get sick of me using the words transparency yeah. and accountability. I use those words over and over and over again. Uh, our position at Ministry Watch is, uh, you know, so for example, if, a pa- if someone, a ministry leader, is making millions and millions of dollars a year, it's not really our role to say that's wrong. It's wrong for somebody to make this amount of money, but it's okay for them to make maybe a different amount of money. What we want to do is simply to bring some transparency to that process. If the, you know, somebody's making a million dollars a year, we just think the public deserves to know that. We think donors deserve to know that. So we think transparency and accountability are the sort of the chief cornerstones of, of what we do. And in order to accomplish that, we do a lot of investigative journalism, We publish uh, anywhere between 70 and 90 stories a month on the Ministry Watch website. So that's usually around two, three, sometimes as many as four or five a day. And we also have a database of the thousand largest Christian ministries in the country. And in that database, which is, again, all free, we don't charge, we don't have a paywall, we don't uh, have advertisers on our website, we don't take money from ministries, we are completely donor supported. We will um, have financial statements for these ministries going back about five years. And we also have some analysis and some ratios so that people that are not used to looking at financial statements can really see what's going on there. So those are the kind of the two big things that we do, the investigative journalism and the financial analysis and the goal, transparency and accountability. And so that's, again, whether you like to face it or not, you have to deal with some scandals that are going to come to your attention with your team yeah. or you yourself, because as you are uh, fighting for transparency, right, which I think is a, a much needed um, ministry like Ministry Watch. So I encourage my listeners and people who watch the show to check out uh, the, the material, the, the, the interviews and all of these articles that Ministry Watch puts out, because as Warren said, and many of us and we're called as Christians to be good stewards of our money, we are to give and to further the work that God is doing through the hands and feet of his disciples. Mm -hmm. And so many times it looks like an institution, a ministry that is fulfilling the Great Commission, Lord willing, right? And we want to make sure that our tithe is going to a cause that is utilizing that material or those resources for the glory of God. And so Ministry Watch provides that. Now, before we look at some aspects of scandalism, you know, to kind of set the stage, Warren, in the Bible, uh, I want to read uh, to you a quote from Ray Stedman. And he says this in his article on his website, Scandal in the Church. One of the growing problems the church is facing today is what to do about the frightening increase in sexual immorality among Christians. I do not think a week goes by, but we hear reports of churches struggling in this area. We hear of Christian leaders who have forsaken their wives, run off with a secretary, fallen into homosexuality, or are facing some kind of a moral crisis in their churches. Many are properly concerned about this and wondering why this should be. So I thought it would be important for us to first start in the Bible, because I think Ray is, is, is right in that this is, this seems to be happening more often where in the scriptures, whether it be old or new Testament, do we see particular scandals and kind of unpack what we mean by scandal first and foremost, so we can kind of set the stage. 
Well, yeah, you know, it's funny. People uh, will sometimes say to me, why do you cover um, stories like we cover? You've mentioned a few of them, Robbie Zacharias, Hillsong. Well, one of the reasons we cover them at Ministry Watch, and I think we should talk about them here with uh, Jason and our, in venues like this, is because they're all through the Bible. I mean, the Bible did not turn a, you know, turn away. Uh, it told the truth uh, whenever things were happening in the, in the Bible that they're not prescriptive, they're descriptive, to use an old uh, Bible hermeneutics uh, expression. You know, just because we see something in the Bible, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're extolling it, but it is an accurate uh, portrayal, an accurate account of what's going on there. I mean, I could, you know, just for example, uh, you know, describe King David to you. King David um, fathers a baby with a married woman and then has that husband killed, right? I mean, that is that is a foul scandal in the church explained in great detail in scripture. And, uh, you know, we also, and, and the other thing that's interesting about the story of David is that you know, Nathan, the prophet, comes to him and describes this terrible behavior, you know, of, of that David himself had been engaged with. Who is that man? Who is that man? He should be, you know, he should be executed. He should be tried. And Nathan, the prophet, just, you know, basically looks at David and says, you are the man. It's one of the most, you know, kind of famous expressions in Scripture. So, again, I, I, that there are lots of other examples of, but that would be one in which, um you know, we see sexual immorality and using one's power uh, in an organization institution, in this case, a nation to get mm. one's way. You know, the story of Ananias and Sapphira in the um, in the New Testament, where, uh, you know, Ananias and Sapphira uh, sold a lot, but only gave half of the money, uh, though they, they their, their um, real sin was lying, I think you could say. I mean, it, they they gave half of their the proceeds for that lot that they sold. So you would think, well, that's pretty generous to give away half the money. But, you know, they had said that they were going to give away all of the money and they did not do that. And uh, so, again, a fun, financial impropriety there. The story of Cain and Abel, the sort of, you could say, the, the I don't know if you would want to say the fall itself, where Adam and Eve, you know, ate the, the the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, but certainly Cain and Abel, the murder of um, is probably the maybe we'll say the second, maybe the first big scandal in Scripture, and um, you know, and that that was a scandal that had far-reaching consequences. Cain was, you know, commanded to go wander to and fro uh, around the face of the earth, and and I think you know maybe some of the implications of that story are that, um, you know, he was. Uh, always and forever without a home since then there was there was turmoil in his life but he probably took that turmoil uh to the world around him as well so you know we see you know i, I could go on jason and i will if you want me to you just ask, <laughs> yeah give me two more award i want two more yeah, scandals yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a of you know uh the, some of the scandals are uh, you know i guess you could say scandalous to the culture Jesus claiming to be the Son of God, for example, that was scandalous uh, to the you know culture in which the Jewish culture in particular, uh, the Virgin Mary getting pregnant and uh, you know having a child, and uh, you know that was uh, scandalous uh, in that culture. Be you know it would uh, if it wasn't the Holy Spirit himself that had made you know Jesus that had made Mary pregnant, it would be. Uh, uh, scandalous in a more conventional sense, but it, but e even the way it was was scandalous to the thought process of that right. culture. The point is, they're all throughout Scripture. We shouldn't turn away with them from them because Scripture doesn't turn away from them. We have to we have to really understand though what's going on and ask ourselves what is God trying to teach us when He puts these scandals in Scripture, and what are we to learn whenever we see these scandals in the church today. Yeah, and so what I want to do, because I think this is helpful, one, let's, as we lay out a case like you made in Scripture, and I appreciate that, I'll give you an A for that, Warren, for, you know, I'll actually, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to applaud you for all of those things that you gave as examples. Yep. So you get an A for that, but it's helpful for firm. people to know that when they see, okay, those are scandals in that sense, okay, it was a scandal uh, for, for Mary to be pregnant before she was technically married w with Joseph, even though we know that God was moving through that. So, but it wasn't good for Mary in a sense, because people could have taken that out of context. Jesus is a great example. I mean, think about all the scandals he wasn't intentionally walking into, like he was sinful, but they were claiming that he was a drunkard, that he was abusing the spirit, 
that he was falsely claiming himself, like you said, to be God. And so there was scandal about that saying, you really think that this guy, a, a poor Jewish, you know, peasant, this rabbi, this, you know, self-proclaimed rabbi is in fact God himself. I mean, hanging out with sinners and prostitutes and having tax collectors, you know, as part of his uh, inner circle. So those were scandals themselves, but we know that he was innocent of those accusations. And so I think that's one thing that I wanted to really bring you on too, because you've done that is where, look, let's, let's understand what a scandal is because I think nowadays it's like entertainment tonight, you know, boom, like the music comes on or like Fox news, you know, it's like this, it's always an alert an alert, you know, something big is going to come. And so people look at the scandal and it's again, sex, money, you know, cars, nice things all the time, you know? Um, and sometimes a scandal can look a little bit different, right? Than what we, we think in the Hollywood yeah. sense. Uh, but there are sometimes people who get into a scandal who didn't do anything wrong and we pray that they're going to be acquitted. So when you and I are going to be talking about this, we want people to understand that not everybody who is attached to a scandal is guilty, right? So, That's so, so, so we know we see some scandals, like you said, with David, but also some scandals that Mary had and Joseph and how they worked through them and how God protected them. Of course, the accusations that Jesus had. And you and I know as, as public figures in ministry, people are going to say false things about uh, any one of us. Now, the difference, though, now is what are some scandals that you have uncovered? Maybe that you didn't break the story, but that you have covered and it, and it, and it come to find out this person is guilty of infidelity. This person is guilty of taking ministry money for their own uh, good. So just share with our audience what are some of the scandals recently that you've covered and reported on? Yeah, well, you know, you've already mentioned Hillsong, and of course, we've written a lot of stories about Hillsong. In fact, I, the other day, uh, Jason, I was on another radio program, and I uh, kind of, and we were talking specifically about the Hillsong scandal. And I did a little search at the Ministry Watch database, and we have written more than fifty stories in the last two and a half years. Uh, sometimes they weren't all about Hillsong. There might be a mention in a podcast or, you know, in a news roundup or something like that. But, uh, you know, so we've done a lot. We've done a lot of work related to Hillsong. Uh, we've done a lot of work related to Robbie Zacharias as well. Um, in fact, we Ministry Watch, before I came to Ministry Watch, we were concerned about Ravi Zacharias International Ministries because uh, back around 2014 or so, they stopped releasing their form mm. 990s to the yeah. public. And yeah. we can talk more about that. that gets a little technical. And, I, you know, we can maybe talk about that later if you want to, Jason. But the bottom line is that for us here at Ministry Watch, as an organization that wants to encourage transparency, when we discovered, when we noticed that Robbie Zacharias was no longer releasing its Form 990s to the public, that caused a red flag for us. And we wrote an article about it way back then, long before all of the scandals um, started breaking. And, you know, I, 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 and I think that's the thing that, you know, I would want to emphasize is that we want people to know what's going on and they can draw their own conclusions. Transparency and accountability, transparency and accountability over and over are the things that we mostly look for. We wrote an article, for example, about Wycliffe Associates, in fact, a series of articles, which is a Bible translation organization down in Florida. Uh, they had some you know, governance and some disclosure issues that uh, we thought were significant. They had resigned, for example, from the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, $50 million a year organization. And they were making some claims that at a minimum couldn't be verified. And in a few cases, we think were actually false or could have been false. And so we wrote about that as well. And uh, you've already mentioned Morris Hill as well. When I was at World Magazine back in 2013 and 2014, I wrote, I broke, actually did break certain aspects Stories. of that story, yeah. including the book buying scandal that uh, Mark Driscoll was engaged in. Yeah. So let's do this. I'm going to show you um, or our, our viewers a video. And I want you to just pay close attention because, again, we can't just assume that everybody knows what you're talking about referring to Ravi. And without going in great detail, we can just address why it's a scandal of how these people were living, for example. And it's not always – actually, a lot of times when you look at it, right, it's it, – when there's sex involved, there's money. It, you know, it's like it's like the, the, the two go hand in hand. You know, it's kind of like the drug, sex, and you know, and rock and roll kind of thing. And mm -hmm. so uh, we don't know what began to lead them down the path, you know, whether it was the, 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 
the pride and greed or lust or vice versa, lust for money, lust for power, you know, and then sex gets involved and all these different scandals. But let, when we're, we're talking about the Hillsong because this is a big one. So I'm going to play this. This is a piece that the ABC News was doing, kind of reporting on um, all these things re- regarding uh, Carl Lentz and, and Brian Houston. So take a listen. Hillsong is the world's best known megachurch with celebrities like Justin Bieber and Chris Pratt as members. But with that much attention, influence, and money, scandals are almost inevitable. Here are all the times Hillsong Church made headlines for less than pious reasons. Pastor Carl Lentz was in many ways the public face of Hillsong Church. He was well known as the spiritual advisor and life coach for his congregant Justin Bieber. And now he's more associated with the affair that got him fired from Hillsong in November 2020. According to a statement by founder Brian Houston and published by People, Lentz's employment was terminated. Explaining the decision, the statement read, This action was not taken lightly and was done in the best interests of everyone, including Pastor Carl, following ongoing discussions in relation to leadership issues and breaches of trust, plus a recent revelation of moral failures. Houston declined to get into specifics, but a day later, Lentz explained the situation on Instagram, confessing, I was unfaithful in my marriage, the most important relationship in my life. In a leaked audio of a church meeting obtained by Page Six, Houston referenced Lentz partaking in multiple extramarital affairs. According to The Sun, it's Hillsong Church's policy to fire both parties of a marriage if one is terminated. That means that Laura Lentz was not only cheated on by her husband, but she lost her job at Hillsong too. In 2021, she revealed on Instagram that as a result of the scandal and marital problems, she'd suffered from anxiety and PTSD. Brian Houston founded Hillsong Church while his father, Frank Houston, created the Sydney Christian Life Center, which was later absorbed into Hillsong. According to The Guardian, Frank also served as the head of Assemblies of God in Australia and New Zealand, where in the 1960s he allegedly abused multiple boys. One victim from Sydney came forward in 1998. His mother reported the abuse to Assemblies of God, led at the time by Hillsong's Brian Houston. Brian forced his father to resign from his church duties, and over the next year, an internal investigation uncovered more abuse cases. While all of that was necessary, Brian Houston overlooked something important. What we didn't do is report it to the police. Neglecting to report child abuse as a crime in Australia. In 2014, Brian Houston testified to the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse that his father, who died in 2004, had engaged in many acts of abuse and assault against minors. The pattern of abuse was something Brian said that he was devastated to learn about. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, the commission censored Brian for his silence. In 2018, 60 Minutes Australia aired a report that uncovered evidence that he actively helped cover up his father's actions. Now, obviously, we could play more of that, but that's the gist so people can understand just in a nutshell how this scandal just kept getting worse and worse and worse. So my question, Warren, is, and not, the, you know, that we don't know all the specifics and details, but how on earth can something like this in the house of God continue to perpetuate itself when you're having multiple leaders now even to the top of covering up sexual abuse, child abuse, child rape from a father to having multiple pastors who have been resigning left and right across the world. And now Brian Houston himself is caught in a scandal with putting himself in situations with women that are not his wife and then blames alcohol and sleeping pills, right? So he's admitting him abusing substance abuse. There's a substance abuse problem here. How on earth, Warren, is this allowed to continue to happen the way that it has for decades? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think a part of the answer is that usually it starts small and, uh, you know, someone looks the other way and when, and, and then it happens again. And maybe people that are around the perpetrator look the other way once again. And before long, the people that look the other way are also part of the problem, right? In other words, if it becomes, if, if at that point it comes into the public and let's say I was doing something wrong, Jason, and you knew about it. Well, if I did it, you know, one time and you kept your mouth shut, you know, maybe a second or a third time. Now, all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, Jason knows what I'm doing and he's never spoken up. He's never said anything. So it must be okay. Or if it's not okay, then Jason's wrong too that Jason should have spoken up. And now I've sort of got this over Jason now, right? Because I can keep doing what I'm doing. Jason won't tell because at this point, it, you know, he's he's been covering it up. And, um, and I think that, you know, that's a really simple and maybe even simplistic example. But I do think that that is in part how it happens. 
And, you know, the um, the Bible it speaks to a lot of these issues in some ways. And you mentioned it a few moments ago yourself, Jason. In some ways, this is really not that complicated. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life uh, they are the you know, the, they're constantly been the reasons that that people will fall, that folks in ministry and leadership uh, will fall or just humans in general will fall. And um, there's another verse that I'm, you know, fond of uh, reciting in these situations, which is that the love, not money, but the love of money yeah. is the root of, and this is the key part of the phrase, a key part of the verse, it's the root of all sorts of evil. A lot of times we mistranslate that and say it's the root of all evil. Well, it's the root of all kinds of evil, all sorts of evil. And I think that in some ways, even a lot of sexual sin often gets tied up into money and power. You know, in other words, we 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 have this money, we seek this money, we want this money, uh, or maybe maybe we have it and we don't want to give it up. And uh, and then that that creates pressure, stress, and then that leads to other kinds of sins, often in an attempt to cover up what we're doing on the money side of things. So anytime there's big money involved, uh, there's a problem. And and so how are you seeing that then? Like examples, like let's look at the Ravi Zacharias. I mean, I knew the guy yeah. personally. You know, he helped really get me started with Dr. Geisler, you know, encouraging yeah. me to start the nonprofit that I'm leading today, Stand Strong Ministries. And we need more young Christian apologists just like you, you know, have a pastoral heart. And again, I, it, it meant a lot to me at the time to be encouraged by, by someone like, uh, you know, at that caliber. And then of course, you know, when you, you, like you mentioned, even going back in 2014, I started to hear some things roughly around that same time into 2016 and everybody, like you said, that were close to him, uh, friends of ours that were in executive positions, VP positions were denying, you know, uh, coming out with, with, you know, uh, you know, lawyers or, you know, saying things that this is unfounded. It's unsub unsubstantiated. We deny, you know, fiercely that this, uh, this ever occurred. Of course, the whole Thompson issue with the, that, the, the Canadian family. Right. Laurie Ann Thompson. Yeah. Laurie Ann Thompson. And then you, we find out that we could, it was very suspicious. And then it was like, well, you know, I, I shouldn't have been dialoguing with a married woman, you know, in, with a private email or over text. That was inappropriate. She sent me inappropriate pictures, but I declined to view them. And like that in itself, we knew was something was going on there. And then you, you hear about this multi-million dollar ministry and he's going around the world without any accountability using donor money, essentially to one, live a lavish lifestyle, but also use donor money for God's kingdom to hire prostitutes, housing many of them, whether it been in Indonesia and you know Malaysia, India, uh, paying women to live a certain life so he can go and, and be with them. So when you look at when you're you're saying when you look at people's nine nineties, is it hard? Warren for for the for people to find out where thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars is going yeah no the short answer to that jason is no it's not hard and the the problem is is that we we want to make excuses so for example when ravi zacharias uh international ministry stopped releasing its form 990s to the public that should have been a huge red flag to lots of people but it just wasn't that we well it's ravi we know ravi ravi's a good guy you know, there must be a good reason that he's not releasing his Form 990s to the public. So we ignore it, or maybe a very few people like Ministry Watch, because we take, a, you know, transparency and accountability so seriously. Uh, and, you know, again, Jason, at the end of the day, it's not, um, there, there are things in life that are simple, but hard, right? Mm. I mean, it's really simple. If I want to lose weight, I need to exercise more and eat less, right? <laughs> Those are the two things I need to do to lose weight. Simple but really hard to do that sometimes in certain circumstances. And I think in some ways that's what we encounter with, with people, especially like Ravi Zacharias. I mean, he's such a gifted communicator in so many ways, and we agree with him theologically in so many ways that we're just, 
that we're, it becomes very, very difficult to actually confront him in these areas that he needs to be confronted in. But in some ways, it's not, it's just not really hard. It's like, do they release their Form 990s to the public? Do they get an annual audit if they're a large ministry? Obviously, a teeny ministry doesn't need to get an audit, but, but uh, bigger ones do. And Robbie was certainly fit in that category. Release them to the public. On the Form 990, you can see things like the salary of key executives. You can see things like the people who are on the board. And if we had uh, was, had been able to see that at RZIM, we would have noted that there were a lot of family members that were on the board and that were in key positions of leadership drawing significant salaries. Again, that would have been a red flag that we didn't, that that didn't get waived, I guess you could, you know, if I could put it that way, because the Form 990s weren't being released to the public. So I know that Form 990 sounds like a real technical and geeky or a wonky kind of a thing for a guy like me to talk about, but it is just really a linchpin. It's really a cornerstone. It's really something that we look at at Ministry Watch. And and if we see in ministry that doesn't release it Form 990s to the public, we raise an alarm about that. Well, and, and I, but see, I think that brings up a good point, Warren, because obviously you and I working with nonprofits and working with the local church for many years, that isn't something that people uh, know about per se yeah. or even yeah. consider because a lot of people, and I'm speaking for a lot of people, I'm sure listening, that's very, that's a very uncomfortable conversation to have approaching leadership and saying, I'd like to see unless, you know, in, 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 if they have it on like the old school church, they have it on the back of the bulletin that you can kind of yeah. see what's, what's come in, what the expenses are, that sort of thing. But details, like you said, you know, a full report, you know, a comprehensive report to kind of see where the dollars are going with operations, with overhead, like you said, the VPs, who's on the board, who are making these decisions. But just for people to understand, that is one way to start looking at, you know, some areas potentially of a scandal, or if people have, if there's some red flags or they're concerned, is ask to look at their 990, or you can go, go to Ministry Watch. You have a thousand of the big ministries. I just was on it the other day. And I was actually hunting down a lot of our friends who run organizations like, oh, okay. <laughs> it was actually fun. Yeah. You know, I was sending some emails, by the way. I was like, I didn't know you make this much, you know. Um, but it was very it was very helpful. So that is that is a, a, a great way for people to start there because you and I believe, this is what Jesus said, where your treasure is there, your heart is also. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't just speaking to an individual. That also is applicable uh, even more so to a ministry that has multiple people and has a great responsibility, right, to steward the the assets and the resources that God, whether it be human beings and their giftedness, right, and their talents, or even just financially when people are donating their hardworking money, or even land, or giving the over, you know, a certain, uh, a possess, have possession over something to use it, you know, to advance their cause. So that is something that people can look at. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And, you know, the other side of that coin, too, is that, if if a ministry is doing great stuff, that's also the place where you can learn that, about right. that as well. Yep. And so it's it's not just all about you know trying to say gotcha to a ministry. It's also an opportunity to say, wow, look at this organization. It's it's being so efficient. It's doing such great work. It's it's leaders uh, make modest salaries. They're living humbly and modestly, even though they have tremendous responsibilities. You know th- that. Th- that information, those Form 990s and the information that we publish on our website also reveal that as well. All right. So what I want to do is I want to pause there, Warren, for our first part of the show. And I'm going to have you come back on for part two. So people who are watching, listening, we want to further this conversation to our second part to now transition into what are some common traits that you see within scandals to start helping you guys provide some discernment when you're seeing things that maybe don't just seem right and you have some questions and how to kind of go about that, also addressing how you can discern if in fact your spiritual leader, whether it be a pastor or a nonprofit organization that you fund or support, or maybe you serve at on a regular basis or you work there full time. Because I know a lot of you guys watch and listen, you guys are involved in full time ministry. And also, uh, in our next podcast show with Warren, I want to talk uh, with Warren about how can we provide some biblical pointers, some tips, 
is that if you guys find yourself right now in the middle of a scandal, how should you respond and what should you do? So Warren, thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate you, my friend. You bet. Thanks, Jason. Well, my friends, thank you guys for listening to the podcast. As always, if you guys have not downloaded the Edify app, you can go to edify.app and download it immediately. It's a great platform. You get shows just like Challenging Conversations. There's other great people on there, uh, friends of mine like Luke, Lucas Miles and uh, Billy Hallowell and so many other people. So that is a great app to help you guys stand strong in your faith. You can also check out my site and all the articles and books and videos that I put out there at standstrongministries.org. And you can also put your email in the e-news there on the website on the homepage. So you can get up-to-date information about our ministry and how you can stand strong and provide you guys with resources, whether it be in your marriage in your own particular faith, or if you find yourself in a situation with an atheist, an agnostic, a secularist, a Hindu, a Buddhist, whatever, We provide resources to help you guys have those challenging conversations with people who have a different mindset than your own. Thank you guys for watching. Until next time, keep having those challenging conversations.